since uh, the theme of the course is the future of the image. And my background is not an artist, I'm not an image maker. Um, uh, and um, my background is in education. So I was struggling with this and decided to start from my own field and not pretend to uh, do something or think something about the future of the image. However, the educational aspect, I believe, is quite central to the future of the image. Um, my focus is on universities and university teaching and learning. And we are all now, even, within the institutional context of the university. So what is happening in the universities how we are educating our future artists is the question that has to do with the future of the art and the future, I guess, of the image. So uh, I'm going to talk to you. I've prepared a paper so that I won't get lost in everything. Uh, and so I talk to you, uh, talk you through my paper, and uh, and then I'll end up. With, if I have time, with so we video piece. And I, as I told you, my background is in dance, and uh, um, I did my PhD at the Theatre Academy of Helsinki about the everyday life of dance institutions. So the institutional context and the question of institution has been very important to me. Since then, I was troubled by doing research on something or about something. And I have moved towards doing collaborative research with and for artists. So I'm involved with artists exploring their work. And my current research interest is on academic development in the arts. And that, or it can be described as educational development or university pedagogy in the arts. It's quite a new uh, field of study, even if the practice has been going on since the mid-19s, both in Finland and abroad, even worldwide. And we have been discussing this issue with David and Nick for a while these days, that the idea is the concept that I just referred to, uh, refer to the courses or programs offered by universities for its faculty to enhance mostly teaching competence. So university teaching is, fo is in focus in these courses. And the problem for me is that these courses are very often organized by the central unit at the university, like Alta University Central uh, Pedagogical Unit. And they are very mm, general, so they, they don't take into account the differences the differentiations in pedagogical practice within different disciplines. And my research focuses on trying to dig with the university teacher into the pedagogical practice and make sense of that with them. So the courses that I'm involved in are kind of research processes into the pedagogy of practice. So, how to educate future artists is my focus in my current research project. That this research focus, of course, opens up to more general uh, questions of teaching and learning in higher education. These are what will the future work look like and how to enhance teaching and learning for the future. And I believe one example of the quite heated debate is the formation of our university, of the university. The idea, I don't know if you are familiar with, with uh, the current uh, uh, things going on in the university sector, but we have seen many transformations lately. So the formation of our university, the idea was uh, that through this new kind of combination of arts and business, science and technology, will enhance the success and prosperity of both individual and nation. That is not only our nation, which is rising and clearly in the focus of the discussion, but nations worldwide. 
or we could talk about the global weird. Also, research on universities has focused on exploring the education for the future, which can sum up in these kind of um, questions. What scopes and skills will be needed for rapidly changing environment? What new skills will be required to be successful in the future? How will we educate our future artists to work in the future? What roles will universities, have, uh, universities uh, play in the future of our communities? It is to, through curriculum that all of this is put into practice and we, it affects student learning. So curriculum, the design to educate artists, is trying to answer to these questions. And here lies the problem for me, and the trouble for me, that is the notion of curriculum and learning. Uh, within the recent 15 years, we have seen a major transformation in our curricular thinking. We have moved from inputs to outputs, from contents and techniques from the discipline to the ex expected performance of students. The way, the way of designing our curriculums and the way we talk about higher education today are mostly based on educational discourse and educational science. So this kind of um, Moving from inputs, the contents, the subjects, the themes, we are now looking at learning outcomes of what they are performing after a certain course, like this course. What are we expected to do afterwards? Marilyn Cochrane Smith describes this trouble in relation to teacher education as the outcomes trap. It is the language, language of results, consequences, effectiveness, impact, and educational accountability that has been stitched into the logic of higher education so seamlessly that it is now is nearly imperceptible. Results, consequences, effectiveness, impact, and so on. I am not blaming the reformations that we have had, like the Bologna process or these uh, university uh, mergers. Uh, which have probably shaken the notion of higher arts education and hence the quite vibrant discussions on the issue in many edited volumes, especially in the fields of fine arts and curatorial practices. There are many or quite a lot of interesting books about the academy at the moment. Nevertheless, the creation of a European-wide or worldwide educational system has meant that the discourse is becoming homogenized. That is how we speak about and sell our education. In fact, Nick uh, has introduced that the process of alignment of higher education across Europe does not primarily propose an international homogenization of curricula and program content or a standardization of outputs but rather an interoperability of service provision and a system of exchange equivalence for outcomes, a common market. So this new curricular thinking is kind of creating a common market to talk about education. What this results in, can you hear me or can you follow me? <laughs> right, good. Uh, what this results in is what Stuart Bailey has described as the pro propagation of school as business, student as customer, and its attendant bureaucracy. All of the, which de generates the ever increasing gap be between actual pedagogy and its marketing image. So what we, how we talk about our universities and practices is becoming homogenized, creating a kind of market for education. But what is happening inside the schools, inside the studios, is a totally different thing. So it's a kind of gap between this course and the practice. This standardized discourse on higher education is prevailing despite the fact that research and disciplinary cultures has emphasized how fundamentally teaching and learning 
are intertwined with the epistemic cultures and social practices of a particular discipline. This means that the teaching and studying practices vary from one discipline to another. The nature and processes of teaching and learning oh, sorry. <laughs> teaching and learning mm, uh, student supervision and assessment as well as collaboration between teachers are approached differently and from different premises. So we cannot talk about pedagogy as if, if it would be one thing, I believe. Now what about the arts then? Mm. Art education or higher edu arts education has been debated quite a lot during the last years. Hank Slager, uh, for example, has proposed that the gradual implementation of the Bol Bologna framework slowly but surely made it very clear that the introverted, romantic, pre-democratic and non-dialogic master pupil model of master class education has, has definitely come to an end in most European countries. The master pupil model had to take way for a course-based modular program while leaving the dominant art historical canon behind. Stuart Bailey offers a more detailed description by mapping the historical trajectory of art and design education. He is identifying how and why past models of higher art education were set up in response to prevailing social conditions. So what are the key models of art and design schools? Uh, art and design schools began to set up as distinct entities following the first industrial revolution in a context of duality between traditional master apprentice model for craft-based profession and the academy studios for fine art training. Now, uh, Stuart Bailey distinguishes three phases and traditions of uh, art and design schools, the academy, the Bauhaus, and contemporary. Uh, the academy describes the period roughly, roughly until the First World War, and therefore also is, it is pre-modernist, or it can be described as pre-modernist. It is based on the underlying notion of a student possessing unique talent specific to a discipline, a one discipline. It is taught through the education of technique in terms of historical chain of development. Its method of teaching is by imitation, involving the reproduction of sameness towards continuity uh, of the particular discipline, like photography or whatever our disciplines are. The Bauhaus, in comparison, describes the period roughly from the First World War on, uh, which can be described as modernist in terms of co coherently grating with ex existing romantic or classical ways of working and thinking, and which has been the foundation of most art and design school in existence today. This is described by Bailey. It is based on the underlying notion of the student possessing general creativity, general creativity, which spans disciplines. It is taught through the education as of a medium, as an autonomous entity, without emphasizing its lineage and continuity. So here and now, this medium. Its method of teaching is by invention, involving the production of otherness in other people by which, as such, emphasizes formalism. The contemporary describes the prevailing condition, which, although underlying the art and design world as a paradigm, different to those described above, has yet, according to Bailey, to yield a widespread collective, sorry, a collective change in the ways its schools are constructed. In short, while these ideas are poured into the existing Bauhaus container, they no, no longer fit. A reasonable comparison with the above models then would suggest an underlying notion of a student possessing general attitude which bounds discipline. It's, uh, it is thought through uh, educational practice, 
through which this attitude is articulated. And its method of teaching is by de deconstruction involving the analysis of a word's constituent parts. Now, in addition to the former key models, there are also some studies that have tackled the question of learning within higher education. So they are digging deeper than these models that describe the general uh, outline of, of uh, higher education. These interesting studies focus on specific art forms such as design or fine arts or music. Thus, it is very difficult to talk about art education in general. In my view, the general talk would do, wouldn't do justice to the diverse art forms and their particular ways of working and studying. Think, for example, of working and studying within fine art or film or new media or sound. Studying can be individual uh, and private studio work or collaborative joint efforts. Studying may involve working mainly with one medium and material or working in interdisciplinary <coughs> fields uh, with multiple media and techniques. Studying may involve rather established artistic approaches or exploratory approaches. The arts in higher education then do not form a closed fit category, but could be understood as a multiple and involving entries towards me meaning making and being in the world. Thus, studying within the arts is not a uniform practice, but rather multiform and multidirectional, constantly <coughs> evolving with the emerging new practices within diverse fields of arts. New practices inspire new pedagogies, as Malcolm Miles has suggested in his edited volume. And so I would like to propose an understanding of learning within the arts as an emergent practice. It is in a constant process of becoming with a view towards embracing the potential of the experiences at hand. Having said that, I want to go back to the studies of learning in higher arts education and offer some fragments of learning within the arts. These are not intended to cover the whole tr truth about studying art. Instead, my aim is to contextualize the notion of learning. Um, Krista Kosonen and Marit Mäkelä from the School of Arts at our university describe a master course which aims at supporting students in managing their creative <coughs> process by documenting and re reflecting on them. They describe how the stepping into the creative process can happen in diverse ways. The trigger for ideation may start during the excursion or any excursion, as well as during the visit to different locations. But furthermore, the inspiration may derive from nature, mm, artist's work, one's own experiences, lectures and discussions, to mention a few examples. What is essential in a creative process, however, is exploration and experimentation. They describe how exploring a previously unknown territory and experimenting or playing with materials and ways of working to, to, to create challenging roles, sorry, prototypes, artifacts, and crafts are hands-on activities to bring out the very essential part of any creative process, the coincidences, failures, and surprise, surprises that happen when one deals with un unfamiliar issues. Exploring and experimentation then can be a means to break boundaries, face uncertainties, and release one from a restricting block when doing and thinking seem to not to proceed in a de desired way. Anne-Marie Edström uh, from Sweden, I don't know if anyone knows her, no? Uh, in her study, uh, in her study has focused on learning and studying in the fine arts. Her specific interest has been to explore what kind of qualities art students actually develop during their studies. She used the notion of resting assured to describe a central characteristic of the qualitative change in the student's relation to their artwork. To rest assured refers to a state of trust 
that the students de develop over time. The students' capacity to rest assured was dissert in relation to three fundamental aspects of their relation to their artwork. The internet, in the uncertain, in the work process. <coughs> to rest assured in the internet refers to experiences of confidence and trust in the individual's <coughs> unique artistic expression. To rest assured in the uncertain has two meanings. One related to the initial phase of uncertainty when starting a new artwork, while the other refers to the kind of uncertainty that is present all through the work process. Finally, to rest assured in the work process refers to an experience of confidence and trust related to the practical aspect of the artistic work. She concludes that in higher education, in visual art practice, goals and contents are left very open and are assumed to emerge through the work of the student. The student is expected to develop his or her own artistic expression in a way that is convincing to the world of art and society, but which cannot be decided beforehand by anyone else or even by the student. Noam Austerlitz, I don't know how you say his name, goes on to argue that <coughs> art and design pedagogy is concerned with the importance of students interacting with openness and uncertainty to enable them on graduation to negotiate the complex and unpredictable demands of the creative industry. This kind of knowledge that art and design deals with is procedural, provisional, socially constructed, and ever-changing. There are few uh, laws, formulae, and tangible content lists that form a visible curriculum. In the creative industry, practitioners and consumers construct what is appropriate, appropriate new and innovative. The pedagogies of art and design relate to these kind of knowledge where many right answers exist and where there is difficulty in articulating in advance what an appropriate response might look like. And so, where's the future of learning in higher art education? I think this is what we know. And I, I don't know, maybe you feel familiar with these type of processes. Despite the above experiences and perceptions <coughs> of learning within higher art <coughs> education, in my view, curriculums within our field and thus learning practices are mostly organized in relation to subject matters or disciplines. In addition, curriculums describe quite strictly, as I mentioned earlier, the learning outcomes, contents, ways of working, which in my view narrows the notion of learning even more as predefined description of expectations and anticipations. So whatever happens in the studio or pedagogical practices, the way we talk about it and describe it in our curriculum is another matter. We are describing something that we expect and anticipate but what is happening Process. So this is the trouble that I'm trying to tackle. So the, a sense of an unknown world or the not yet known in a way has never entered into curricula and pedagogical thinking. Here I'm moving into Jacques Rancière and I'm quoting his work mainly uh, from uh, Emancipated Spectator in which he discusses theater and the performance, and how performers, the spectators, are in relationship with one another. However, this idea that he develops there is very much uh, similar to the ignorant schoolmaster, where he explicitly talks about pedagogy. So they are quite uh, parallel to each other. So following Jacques Rancière's description of the logic of pedagogy, pedagogical processes, the trouble is that the learner, as well as the spectator, is positioned as recipient of knowledge or as an onlooker of the performance. 
It is the very logic of the pedagogical relationship. The role assigned to the schoolmaster, he uses that word, in that relationship is to abolish the distance between his knowledge and the ignorance of the ignoramus. His re lessons and the exercises he sets aim gradually to reduce the gulf separating them. Unfortunately, he can only reduce the distance on condition that he cons con constantly recreates it. To replace ignorance by knowledge, he must always be one step ahead in instal a new form of ignorance between the people and himself. And we can think about this as the curriculum, as he always know what he needs to do beforehand. So it's a kind of similar kind of positioning. So this kind of positioning builds on roles, hierarchies and distance, in which one of the partners has knowledge while the other one does not. The transmission of knowledge is supposed to be conveyed directly from one to the other. There is something on one side in one mind or one body, a knowledge, a capacity, an energy that must be transferred to the other side, into the other's mind or body. And this is predicated on a relation of inequality. My question concerns whether learning could be understood as a broader sociomaterial practice that goes beyond the current notions of curriculum or learning as an acquisition of knowledge and skills or participation in an existing practice or knowledge <coughs> construction or deconstruction. And here I come again to Jacques Rancière who offers many interesting concepts for rethinking or reconceptualizing learning and curriculum. And here I elaborate only a few of them. No. Now, one of them I find interesting is in this emancipated spectator is the blurring of boundaries or territories. Um, he writes in the emancipated spectator that we also learn and teach, act and know as spectators who all the time link what we see to what we have seen and said, done and drank. There is no more a privileged form, then there is a privileged starting point. Everywhere there, is a start, there are starting points, intersections and junctions that enable us to learn something new. If we refuse, firstly, radical distance, secondly, distribution of roles, and thirdly, the boundaries between territories. <coughs> now, radical distance uh, refers to the idea uh, that we don't have to transform spectators into actors or ignoramuses into scholars, so students, masters. We have to recognize the knowledge at work in the ignoramus and the activity peculiar to the spectator. So every spectator or student or pupil is already an actor in her story. Story. Every actor, every man of action is the spectator of the same story. Every spectator is already an actor in her story. Every actor, every man of action is the spectator of the same story. So radical distance, if we need to refuse the radical distance between the roles of the uh, student and the master, or student and the teacher, or spectator and the actor, and need to acknowledge the knowledge at work already in the uh, spectator, if you get any idea of this. So, the teacher does not teach his pupil his knowledge, but orders them to venture into the forest of things and signs to say what they have seen and why, and what they think of what they have seen, to verify it and have it verified. Every distance is a factual distance, and each intellectual act is a path, path that trades between a form of ignorance and form of knowledge, a path that constantly abolishes any fixity of hierarchy of positions with their boundaries. Now, one concept that is very essential, in which, in which I won't go here, is the idea of inequality of intelligences. Equality of intelligences meaning that the student is already knowledgeable of many things and that needs to be acknowledged. 
Now, uh, the refusance of distribution of roles, ref uh, Abraxia discusses the distribution of roles in many instances, and actually Christopher introduced the idea of the worker, <coughs> worker who transgressed the notion of being a worker. You remember the, the story about Gabriel Goni, who was a worker and then during the night um, in his imagination went into another kind of, uh, uh, or transgressed the notion of being a worker. So we might think that as the detachment from the distribution of the sensible. So Rancière writes, but what he, uh, what he recounted was not like the day of rest of the worker, repl replenishing his physical mental strength for the working weeks to come. It was an incursion <coughs> into quite a different kind of leisure, the le leisure of aesthetics who enjoy the landscapes, forms, and light and shade of philosophers who settle into a country inn to de develop metaphysical hypothesis, hypothesis of apostles who apply themselves to communicating their faith to all the chance companions encountered on the path or in the inn. So in the distribution of no roles or the boundaries or, or blurring the boundaries between roles of the student and the teacher is quite essential into this thinking. Who is teaching who? and who is persistent in what kind of role. Now, Rancière uses the story of Goni uh, and the letters he explored to point out the necessity of blurring the boundary between empirical history and pure philosophy, the boundaries between disciplines and the hierarchies between levels of discourse. One of the, uh, so what I'm trying <coughs> to, you know, I've picked out instances in Rancière's writing that could give me possibilities of thinking of pedagogy in the art in another way. So this kind of blurring of boundaries, or here disciplines, uh, shake the notions of curriculums, which is quite based on disciplines nowadays. So what would kind of curriculum be if we shook the hierarchies of disciplines or different discourses? And I don't know the answer, but I want to kind of shake the conceptual notions of learning and the curriculum. Um, um, one of the bl blurring of boundaries has occurred within the arts, and Rancia discusses this in The Emancipated Spectator, describing how art forms are transformed transforming or translated into one another. He writes, today we have theater without speech and spoken dance, installations and performances by way of plastic word, words, video projections transported into series of frescoes, photographs treated as tableau vivant, or history painting, sculptured metamorphosed into multimedia shows and other combinations. But like David yesterday discussed, this doesn't mean that they are blurring into one another of being the same, but crossing the boundaries between different art forms. Now, one interesting blurring of boundaries has occurred between art and education. And I think yesterday we saw two self-presentations that could, at least two, that could be understood as education as well, David and John. So we might think of those as educational practices. And in fact, Nick has edited a volume on the education, educational term within artistic and curatorial practices. Here I won't go into that discussion, but just to mention it as an example of quite a significant, significant blurring of territories. So what is pedagogy? What is education? And where can we find it? Now I want to play with the idea of blurring the boundaries uh, within higher education. If we accept Rancière's notions about of uh, refusing the radical distance and um, uh, distribution of roles and boundaries between territories, uh, what might it mean 
in higher arts education. Let's define pedagogical relationships. Who is the teacher? Who is the learner? Who is the student? Less of boundary between higher education and society. We could all even talk about public pedagogy and bringing that public pedagogy into discussion in, in the university. So public pedagogy is how, for example, institutions, hospitals, whatever, teach us. And what do we learn wherever? How do we take this society and the pedagogy of society into university? Less of boundary between disciplines. Well, Francia discussed the blurring of boundaries between honest forms. How could we do that? What would be, be a new curriculum if we had less boundaries between disciplines? Less cl clarity of the aims of higher education and learner autonomy. I want to go to the another central concept that um, Francia uses in his uh, books on, on ignorant schoolmaster and uh, emancipated spectator. And in fact, he has published the emancipated spectator as a um, different article somewhere else, and that's quite good. It's the, pretty much the same, but a little more detailed. Uh, the original meaning of an emancipation, as stated by Rancière, emerged from the state of minority. Emancipation as reappropriation of a relationship to self lost in a process of separation. Now, emancipation is also uh, uh, central in the context of critical pedagogy, uh, in which it has been understood as a process of making students or pupils or the oppressed aware of their conditions, positions, and perceptions, and by that liberate them from these. Or connect, uh, or connect knowledge to power and the ability to take constructive actions, or the idea of transforming students from passivity to activity. So the idea of emancipation is something that we kind of release somebody from an oppressed situation in society. Now for Ranciere, oh, uh, the idea of emancipation is somewhat different. The principle of emancipation is the dissociation of cause and effect. The paradox of, uh, paradox of the ignorant master lies therein. The student of the ignorant master learns what his master does not know, since his master commands him to look for something and to recount everything he discovers along the way while the master verifies that he is actually looking for it. The student learns something as an effect of his master's mastery, but he does not learn his master's knowledge. So uh, the logic of emancipation in higher art education then could be understood not as liberating students from their conceptions, but I want to understand and think about emancipation uh, as the emancipation of the teacher and the student from any pre-described expectations as opening up to the manifold translations. Of so instead of teachers being the ones who transform the curriculum into the students, what would be the situation if we didn't have these pre-described expectations? So liberating the teacher from the oppression of the university. <laughs> no. So it is not the transmission of the teacher's knowledge or inspiration to the students. It is the third thing that is owned by no one, whose meaning is owned by no one, but which subsists between them, excluding any uniform transmission, any identity of cause and effect. 
So this emancipation shapes the idea of cause and effect, of teachers teaching into the, the learning of the student. So this is disruptive in the idea of emancipation in Brazil. Later, he discusses the idea of aesthetic efficacy, aesthetic efficacy, which further underlines the rupture between cause and effect. He writes, aesthetic efficacy means a paradoxical kind of efficacy that is produced by the very rupturing of any determinant link between cause and effect. This last notion of refusing the identity of cause and effect also inspires me in thinking about higher art education. In relation to the intolerable image, Ramsier discusses the resistance to anticipation between what we anticipate in the future, for example, uh, uh, delivered to the uh, spectator. Which, uh, the resistance to anticipation, which I link to the idea of learning outcomes. If we start from the not defining what we anticipate or expect as the effects of higher education, we might get new configurations of what can be seen, what can be said, and what can be thought, and consequently, consequently a new landscape of the possible, possible. But this can be done only on condition that the effect is not anticipated. So if we follow Ramsier, uh, it is obvious that the premises of and practices of higher education are quite different from the current forms, the outputs. We might call it constructing um, an emancipated community of higher art education or an aesthetic community. What it produces is not rhetorical persuasion about what must be done, nor is it the framing of collective body. It is a, multiplic a multiplic no, multiplication of connections and disconnections that reframe the relation between bodies, the world they live in, and the way in which they are equipped to adapt to it. It is a multiplicity of folds and gaps in the fabric of common experience that change the cartography of the perceptible, the thinkable, and the feasible. What I try to do is in process, in new progress, and I have no answer, but many uh, messy thoughts. And it, this has been a conceptual discussion, or aiming at transforming the notions of learning and curriculum, and as such, it might have some consequences for discourses on higher education, especially higher arts education, curriculum design, and teaching practices. In an approach briefly outlined in this talk, Learning is not an isolated into universities or classroom islands. Instead, universities or classrooms are understood as nodes or not of many and even surprising sets of material things, practices, experiences, and relations that are all part or have an effect and an effect in learning. Learning is relational, occurs in encounters both with human and non human energies, in diverse assemblages. The moment when one person, thing, practice, experience, encounters another, they can perform something new or something familiar or something unexpected. It is the source of uncertainty, openness, and flexibility that this new approach or new, new to learning we seek to render vivid again. By transgressing our current notions of learning and curriculum, we might be able to create not only spaces where learning can be experienced in complex, complicated, and connected ways, in ways that honor the, the processes of art, but also create a pedagogical language that is sensitive to the processes of learning in the arts. And yesterday, when I had a walk on the dunes or at the beach, I was just thinking that could this kind of a university or curriculum or learning be thought as an aesthetic education in the way Grancier thinks about it, uh, aesthetic or an aesthetic academia or aesthetic university in the way 